good evening, everybody. It's uh, Thursday, January the 25th, 2019, 3 o'clock p.m., and we're getting ready to start our housing authority campaign. Commissioner Obachowski? Here. Commissioner Henry? Here. Commissioner Adair? Here. Commissioner Turnbull? Present. Commissioner Schiller? Present. Next, I would like to entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. Make a motion to to approve the agenda. Is there any chance to do that? Are you going to speak before? It's not an agenda item. Okay, it won't be agenda. Okay. Uh, second. Chairman Lewis? Yes. Vice Chair Rose? Yes. Commissioner Obertowski? <coughs> yes. Commissioner Henry? Yes. Commissioner Adair? Yes. Commissioner Turnbull? Yes. Commissioner Turnbull? Yes. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we have the Honorable Mayor from the city of Urbana with us uh, this afternoon, as well as other people from the community. I'm glad that you're here because this is a transparent organization. We've always been transparent. We've never been in violation of the Open Meeting Act, even though some would like to interpret it different, but this is for itself. Also, we'd like to inform everybody we have very independent thinkers on this board, but they are very capable individuals of the utmost integrity. We do not polarize the vote. If there's an agenda that is uh, moving the community forward, we have enough people of utmost integrity that it will get past. So I just wanted to make that known to everybody. And we, we always welcome the public to come to our meeting. Your feedback is uh, important to us, whether it's negative or positive mm -hmm. feedback. Because we are trying to, uh, to do the best for the Champaign County in the area of providing housing for people of low and medium income. Uh, <clears throat> at this time, uh, we'd like for David to make a, a statement and to read a statement before we have public comment on it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chuck, sir. Um, I just wanted to just add and reiterate the fact that we understand that in any situation, change is challenging. And we've worked hard over the uh, last year or so to ensure that we make change that's positive to benefit all citizens in the community uh, in which we serve. And so with that being said, I would like to have Nick, who's our executive intern, uh, working uh, on his uh, master's to come up. And just so those individuals that may not have had an opportunity to see the statement that we put out yesterday related to the criminal background change, uh, Nick's going to go over it for us real fast. And Nick, uh, Nick's just started with us, and he's been uh, great so far. He's even working on a re -entry, new reentry grant with the uh, Illinois Housing Development Authority for us. So why don't you just briefly introduce yourself, Nick, and uh, read the statement that we prepared, please. Hello, everyone. It's nice to meet all of you, or if I've met you before, and to see you again. Uh, my name is Nick Olson. I'm currently pursuing a master's degree in public policy at the University of Chicago Harris School. Um, prior to that, I worked in a couple of years with an affordable housing developer in Rhode Island. So housing is really kind of my policy focus. So I'm really happy to be here working for this agency and with this community. And um, as Mr. Norland said, I'm just going to be reading the statement we put out yesterday. The Housing Authority of Champaign County is aware that there are many individuals in our community who are overcoming obstacles specifically individuals with criminal backgrounds. Our agency is committed to listening to the suggestions and concerns of stakeholders within the Champaign County community. Our hope is to develop a more inclusive policy and smoothly transition our clients and the community through the changes. Many individuals and advocacy groups have offered their perspective on the proposed policy presented in the 2019 draft admin plan. With the guidance of the Board of Commissioners and the expertise of HACC leadership, we are making strides to improve our policies while ensuring the health and safety of our clients. 
Over the past 15 months, we have made tremendous progress in repairing relationships with clients, partner agencies, and the Champaign County community. And we intend to continue engaging in open dialogue with HACC stakeholders and honoring the significance of community engagement. What we know about the screening process for criminal backgrounds. One, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development requires a background check for all adult household members applying for federally subsidized housing. Public housing authorities are allowed to adopt their own reasonable criminal history policies as long as they include HUD's automatic denial criteria. Two, because of the systemic disparities of the United States criminal justice system, members of marginalized communities have suffered in many ways, including in the inability to access subsidized housing. Three, HACC's current policy is extremely restrictive as it re relates to the screening process for criminal backgrounds and needs to be changed. Four, despite the presence of these restrictions, in the past 12 months, only one applicant has been denied for criminal history under the current policy. This was an individual with a record containing multiple violent felonies. Most denials are based on non-responsiveness or non-compliance with moving to work requirements. In that same period, 187 applicants were admitted. HACC's new policy will allow all applicants denied for criminal history to have a mandatory informal review of the decision, taking mitigating factors into consideration. This will apply for all members of a household receiving HACC assistance. Six, outside HUD mandated criteria, only certain criminal convictions within the past three years, which may cause reasonable concerns for the safety of other tenants or property will be considered grounds for denial. Arrest records alone will not be grounds for denial. Any information regarding criminal history will remain confidential. Seven, HACC's proposed policy changes are a vast improvement from where we started. The overarching goal is to fine tune the eligibility requirements in order to maximize the ability for individuals and families to have access to affordable housing. We are absolutely moving in the right direction. Eight. HACC has created guidance for appealing a denial for criminal history. All HACC staff reviewing applications will be trained in the new guidelines. HACC's primary goal is to improve our screening process to be more inclusive. We intend to create a policy that utilizes a screen-in approach rather than screen-out. Additionally, we plan to continue to invest in re-entry programs and to promote self-sufficiency for all individuals, including those with criminal backgrounds. Although our policy changes are an improvement, we are aware of the need to create a policy with rational relationship between the eligibility requirements and the need to protect tenant safety and landlord's property. Accordingly, HACC will plan to recommend an approved updated policy at this Thursday's board meeting. After approval of the updated admin plan, HACC will do the following. Development panel discussion, appoint an ad hoc committee to recommend policy changes to the HACC board, conduct a board study session, revisit the criminal history screening policy within six months for possible policy changes. Please feel free to reach out with ACC with any questions or concerns regarding these changes. Your cooperation and understanding are highly appreciated. And um, just some specifics. Before you go into that, Nick, uh, we did add to the, um, the letter uh, the data around how many people was um, denied, wasn't available. We had staff in training, so we pulled that data. And just to reiterate, over the last 12 months, only one person was denied based on a criminal history, and that one person had three violent felonies. And one of the felonies was against a uh, peace officer. So you can go ahead to the next thing. Okay. And just some more specifics on the details of changes from the previous policy to the proposed changes. Um, HACC is planning to reduce uh, the criminal activity um, range from five years to three years uh, for criteria other than um, the HUD mandated denials. Um, we're changing language to we may deny, uh, but we're allowing for consideration of those mitigating circumstances. Um, and we're removing language that applicants can be denied solely for being incarcerated. Um, and we have also removed language regarding medical marijuana from the draft administrative plan. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. I totally appreciate it. Nick's been an asset, um, like I said, when, since he's been here and 
he's a local guy uh, living locally, working out in Chicago, and we hope to keep him on board for a while working with us. Thanks again. I appreciate it. I'll try to stick to my three minutes. My name's Diane Marlin, Mayor of Urbana. I've been meaning to stop by um, for several months now to say thank you. And so when the opportunity to comment on the administrative plan came up, I'm going to combine both. So I'm going to start with my thank yous. I, I also sent out my comments um, yesterday to you in advance. So on behalf of the city of Urbana, I want to express my appreciation for the significant progress that I think the housing authority has made in the last few years, especially toward greater transparency. You've been transparent, but I think it's much greater now. I appreciate that a great deal. And as well as your um, renewed commitment to development of housing in Urbana. We're very, very excited about the prospect of Pinewood Place being um, built on Colorado Avenue. I think it's going to serve a great need in our community. And then farther down the line, we look forward to um, the uh, development where on the former Urbana townhome site. So I do appreciate your commitment to affordable housing in Urbana. Um, specifically with regard to the administrative plan, I'm just going to summarize um, what I sent you yesterday. But I, I truly appreciate your proposed changes that I've heard about so far. I think, um, as I said in my comments, I think the best approach in my mind is, you know, as, as you've noted, is, is don't think about all the ways you can keep people out of housing, but answer a couple of basic questions, including you know, what criteria do you need to um, make sure that you protect the health and safety of your, your clients, your staff, um, property owners and managers, but while still providing housing that is needed? And then um, what do you need in order to administer a financially sound and sustainable program? So, you know, those are two, I think, general ways to approach your mission. I look forward to um, helping in whatever way we can with the uh, rewriting of these particular sessions. I would, um, again, encourage you to, um, to make sure whatever language you use, it's very clear and concise. I, I read section 2.18 and 19 several times, and I, I have to say I got kind of lost in the um, as I made my way through it. So anything you can do to clarify that language and make it extremely clear to the public and to the clients, it would be helpful. Um, as you know, the Urbana Human Rights Ordinance um, has very clear language with regard to discrimination based on prior arrest or conviction. And I think that language should be included um, in, in your policy. And. Um, I'm glad to hear that solely you, you're not going to be restricting people based on solely past incarceration because that's not necessarily a predictor of how they will perform or behave or carry out their lives after incarceration. So that's a very important point to um, that you're approaching. So anyway, I think you're headed in the right direction and we'll be happy to help in any way we can to get the very best policy that we can get. But thank you so much for your progress so far. And again, thank you for the increased transparency and for your commitment to, to build in Urbana. Thanks. My name is Esther Pat. I am director of the Champaign-Urbana Tenant Union at 44 East Main Street in downtown Champaign. Uh, and I also want to speak about the administrative plan and, and particularly this uh, issue of criminal conviction record. Uh, first, I, I'm very pleased that you are moving forward with re-examining the whole thing and, and a timeline where you are coming back um, with a hopefully a revised proposal. Uh, I have been working on the, well, rental housing issues and on and off of this particular issue for 43 years now since the human rights ordinance work first in um, Champaign and Urbana starting in 76. And one of the things that, um, well, two things I just want to, I want to tell you one thing about, I'm glad you only turned down one applicant in the last year, but I don't even know how to estimate how many people who would be otherwise eligible did not apply to housing authority because 
either they or a member of their family has um, some kind of a criminal record. And I go to Daily Bread Soup Kitchen once a month for the tenant union, and that's and when I go with a low cost list and subsidize the first things people ask is like, was well, conviction going to matter? And then you know, knowing the policy, I ask the specific questions. But I think a lot of people just don't even try, and it's um, it's a real shame. I'm I'm so glad that you want to do something about keeping families from being separated because some of their family members came into the country illegally, but. Policies that discriminate based on conviction record also keep families apart. When what if your your 19 year old son or your husband has a conviction record, then you and the kids, the rest of the kids, just you know you can't get into housing, or at least people think that. Um, I would like to encourage you to take the approach, and, and not just take the approach, but each of you as individual commissioners to think about this whole question in the context of discrimination. I think a big problem that people have with I mean, where they come, where, where you end up with policies that are discriminatory, is that you're not looking at it from the point of view of, well, as, as Mayor Marlin said, what do you need to do? You're looking at what should be our criminal record policy be. That's the wrong question. Don't look at it that way. What you should be looking at is, what is it? What has? What is a past behavior, not a status, but a behavior that is a behavior that we don't want here? So, for example, and this one just always kills me, there are so many people who get arrested at a traffic stop for something they've got in their pocket. Their landlord's never even going to hear about it. Why should they? Because it had nothing to do with the apartment. Yet when they go to apply for housing, if this is in their record, that is then like, oh, does it mean they'll be a bad tenant? I mean, if you don't want someone to be a bad tenant, if you don't want bad tenants, look at their rental history. Have they been bad tenants in the past? Even if they have a criminal record, was it for doing something bad at the place they lived? Was it for doing something bad at the place where anyone lives? And the traffic stop example is a perfect one of where it has nothing to do with their housing at all. There are landlords who don't want to rent to people with mental disabilities because they don't want tenants who are going to go at 4 in the morning banging on the neighbor's doors and screaming or urinating on the carpet. Well, just because a person has a mental disability does not mean they will do that. You should be looking for people's rental history of do they have a history of screaming in hallways or urinating on carpet, et cetera. So if you take that approach of what are the dangerous things we're afraid people will do if they are in our housing communities and how do we find out about them? And some of that will lead to looking at the criminal record, but you'll be looking for those types of things, for wrongful acts pertaining to people who are living in residential communities. And I think if you take that approach, you'll get to a much, you'll get to a much better conclusion. Thank you. How, how many other people would like to <clears throat> come in on uh, agenda item? Can I hold your comments to about three minutes? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, my name is Kyle Patterson. Uh, I work at the Cunningham Township, and um, I also serve on the Champaign County Board. Uh, this is my first time coming out to one of these, and I just want to thank all of you for your service. Um, in my day job, I work as a case manager for rental assistance, and I see every day the lives that you all save through the programs you provide. And when I say that, I literally mean that. According to the National Coalition of the Homeless, homelessness shortens the life expectancy by 20 to 30 years. So when somebody can be in affordable housing and somebody can be housed, that literally saves lives. Um, right now, according to the RPC, the median rent in Champaign County is $904. For a lot of people in our community who are on disability, particularly SSI, their monthly income is $771. And as somebody who works with different leases, I mean, I can tell you the most common uh, low rent you're going to find in Champaign, Urbana is $600. For these people, there is not an option if it is not for you all. And uh, uh, very grateful for that. And I, I just wanted to come to you guys today to talk about uh, my perspective and what I see working day to day with. Um, I mean, essentially, your people are my people. Um, and when somebody is paroled uh, from the Department of Corrections, if they do not have an address, uh, they cannot be paroled. That means that they serve out the remainder of their parole in the Department of Corrections. So these people are being paroled. They're more than likely to be poor and black. And if they are poor and black, they are likely to be going home to uh, whether it's their mother, uh, the mother of their children, a family member of some sort. If that family member is uh, who is more than likely to be low income is living in subsidized housing, um, that family member is faced with a choice between allowing their loved one to stay in prison or possibly be homeless or to be housed. So 
preventing that from happening isn't necessarily, creating a rule is not preventing that from happening. Creating that rule is putting people at risk because I don't know many parents. I'm sure most of you are parents. I'm a parent. Uh, if that was my choice, I would risk eviction. And if somebody is evicted in this community, like I said, the median rent is $904. SSI is 771. What you work on is so fragile. And this situation is very grave. And I just ask that when we make decisions to always keep that in your mind. And I, I trust you all to do that. And thank you for your service. I mean, there's very little to say to follow that. Um, my name is Alan. I work at the Cunningham Township as an intern. I'm also a UIUC student and a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. The main thing is, and I can't stress this enough, where else can a so-called high-risk tenant go? There are reasons other than income that people are re rejected or denied access to a lease. So if they aren't supported here, where else can they go? While we know about the point in time counts here, the statewide, it's about 10,000 people. If you actually look at the K through 12 data, it's 50,000 people statewide. So this isn't just about those particular persons with those particular records, but inevitably they have a family. Inevitably they have kids. And the stability of their schooling is something that needs to be kept in focus. So when considering the removal of this rule I, or the implementation of this uh, new, this new administrative plan, thank you, it's important to just keep in mind the additional people affected by this rather than that just one person with just that one record. Good afternoon, board. My name is Martel Miller. Uh, I've been to several housing authority meetings about policies that y'all have put on our community. I would love for y'all to take a look at what um, housing authority, the federal put on. They, they got the guidelines. Anytime you add something extra, it's be like discrimination. Anyone coming out of prison is at their lowest. And like, my, my partner, Cal, said that I work with, when you come on parole, if you ain't got no place to stay, you can't get out. And most of these people are coming back from the neighborhood they left or, the, or, or a subsidized housing. So when you do put a policy, it's discrimination. And, and a policy of discrimination really affect people that look like me, you know? And we got so much going on in the United States right now with, from other government officials, with, with immigrants and all like that. This list, the least of policies, you know, what, what you get from housing, the Federal Housing Authority, if it works for them, it should work for you. You know, you can deal with a problem when it happens. Uh, you know, you can't take what you think is going to happen and make a policy for it. You know, so I'm thinking when someone comes home, just use what the federal government gives you. Let's don't have a policy for Champagne, then they have one for Decatur, then they have another one. Let's just make it just straight across the board what the federal uh, government said that y'all should do. That's what housing authorities needs to do. Any other policy is discrimination. And that's like Jim Crow law. Like I told Champaign government, when the government get, when people on boards decides they want to put other policies, it's discrimination. And for what y'all doing, it's like a uh, Jim Crow law. And I wish y'all would not have any other policy than what the federal government give y'all. Thank you.
Thanks for all the public comments. I just want to end by just saying I, we totally appreciate it. As um, some of you mentioned, and I know the board feel the same way, that we want to be extremely inclusive and we want to continually work with our community. Um, as Nick read, we have made some substantial changes to our policy by reducing the time frame. We've, you know, uh, removed incarceration. So we totally uh, against um, denying anybody solely against incarceration. And also, um, you know, we removed the language about applicants denied for being incarcerated. And again, I do appreciate the fact that we could do better at this at this time, but we're working toward that goal. Now, HUD does uh, require two main uh, requirements for screening related to a drug-related policy. One is a lifetime sex offender, and the other is a, a person convicted of um, manufacturing methamphetamines in a, a public house and a facility. And then the statement goes further to say, each housing authority has a right to create a screening policy around criminal uh, backgrounds. Most housing authorities have made that decision to create that policy. And not saying that we, you know, should have something restrictive, but you know, we should have a policy to screen for housing. Not saying it should just be for criminal uh, backgrounds, because our screening policy not just includes in criminal backgrounds; it, it includes credit checks, it includes landlord history, it includes a lot of items that we look for. And so, I just want to encourage the uh, members of the uh, community and the members of um, the crowd here today, and the individuals that um, spoke to just uh, have confidence in us that we're moving in that direction to really create a better environment. Again, um, we can't account for the individuals that didn't apply for our, our housing, but I know that um, we came a long way from where we started. And not only have we made changes to the criminal justice, um, where the criminal background screening policy, it was policies in our plan that was more restrictive <laughs> than the criminal uh, background that caused us not to be able to lease up units. And this, the changes that we're making are moving our agency so much further where more citizens of Champaign County will have that ability to be on our program and have the ability to be, um, um, have the ability to be housed and overcome obstacles. And that's individuals that with criminal backgrounds and without. And so I wanna thank the staff, the board, the community members that you know, um, you know, commented on the policy. We have made some changes since the last time um, and I think we did a, a pretty good job, and uh, we are dedicated into moving forward, working more inclusively. As we said, we want to have a, a panel discussion about the issue. We want to get an ad hoc committee to really design and look at policies to make a recommendation to the board about possibly changing our current policy. And we're dead, that's something that we're dedicated to do as an organization. Thank you. mind going over the summary resolution uh, that was proposed by the Housing Authority uh, for the uh, changes that we make, the overall changes that we're making to our uh, admin plan? Yes. The last update for the administrative plan was in 2015. Since that time, HUD regulations and annual updates to the moving to work plan has resulted in the need to modify the administrative plan in order to keep in compliance. Listed below are the updated administrative changes. Tenant-based vouchers. Revision to the administrative plan will eliminate local preferences and use set-asides for the certain target populations. Right-sizing vouchers. If a change in family composition causes the household to be overhoused while residing in an approved unit, the family will be permitted to remain in the current unit provided the housing is no more than one bedroom uh, difference and a contract rent charge by the landlord is not, not more than the applicable local payment standard for the PRESM in which the unit is located. Triennial recertifications. Recertifications for the household in which all household members are 65 and older or disabled, even if household members have earned income, will be recertified only on a triennial basis. 
mandatory LSS program. New admission households, including households reporting from another jurisdiction, will be provided with six months from the date of initial lease up in Champaign County to be compliant with LSS requirements. If a new household is not compliant with the LSS requirements prior to submission of a request for tenancy approval, they must meet an LSS coordinator and develop an LSS plan. HAPS will not improve a RAFTA until the household has developed a plan and executed the LSS contract. Work requirements shall be based on the annual earned income or number of hours employed. The minimum earned income for compliance with the work requirement shall be based on the years in which the household has received assistance. Each year, the earned income requirement will increase to prepare individuals for, for exit from assistance at the end of the eight-year term. The minimum numbers of hours work shall be 25 hours. The income tier shall be based on the percent of the median, median area, excuse me, of the area median income for Champaign County. Internal recertifications. Internal recertifications will be conducted in accordance with the LSS pro program provisions or if the total number of hours otherwise changes by $300 or more um, $300 per month. Local inspection standards. This activity was approved in the 2014 plan and modified in the 2015. However, it was never implemented. The activity was closed out in 2016. The intent of the local inspection standards was to be utilized, was to utilize local building codes for inspection of housing choice voucher units. Champaign County has three major municipalities and each has a different, as a distinct building maintenance code. In development of this activity, HAC has anticipated that the local building inspectors would perform their inspections in according with their corresponding jurisdiction. After further analysis, local building code inspectors, inspectors were not cost effective. Additional analysis demonstrated that having HAC inspections staff use uh, four different inspection standards proved an administrative burden. Therefore, it was determined that it was best to close out this activity as it would not meet any of the statutory ob objectives under the MCW program. HAC will continue to utilize HUD housing quality standards for the Housing Choice Voucher Program and will conduct biennial inspections, uh, initial move inspections, and complaint inspections. Project-based voucher. HAC, at its discretion, may allow for tenant-based vouchers to move into fair market units in light tech developments. Program moves. Vouchers will be issued for an initial, an initial 90 day periods. Participants may request one extension of, thir of 30 additional days. Um, under other criteria for admission, HAC reduced the, the criminal activity from five years to three years for criteria other than mandatory denial of assistance. Change the language to HAC may, may deny but allows for mitigating circumstances to be considered. We remove the language for an applicant that can be denied for being incarcerated. HAC will not deny <coughs> solely on incarceration. Under reasonable accommodations, HAC has removed language regarding medical marijuana from the uh, draft administrative plan. Thank you for reading that, um, Tiffany. So what the agency did was we made, we gave a list of the resolution related to all the changes that we made in our admin plan that was not updated since uh, 2015. Uh, many of the changes correspond with our MTW plan that was approved uh, earlier this year. And our goal is now to align all admin changes along with MTW uh, plan approval so we can be on one accord. As I mentioned before, by having an MTW plan approved with not a corresponding admin plan, we're not allowed to actually follow the guidance. So we've been in limbo for a while as we work toward getting this policy approved. And uh, based on what we've done, I uh, uh, recommend that the board move forward with approving of the policy as read. I can't entertain a motion at this time. I make a motion to approve item five and the approval of the 2019 administrative plan. Second. Roll call. Chairman Lewis. Please. I have a question. So, um, I have three questions. The first is, and I pass this up to the commissioners. So is the typo that it says HACC may deny assistance when it says it's mandatory, shouldn't it be shall in that section? In, in that section, some of the items in there are mandatory and others aren't. So okay. that's why we use May. Keep it that same. Yeah. Okay. The second is, um, and I have, if you look at the document I provided, um, you say 
that the, they may be denied assistance below, but, but earlier on it says housing authority will also deny assistance. Is that a typo? Is it supposed to be may? For, for, for page 25? Yeah, it's. That was changed to uh, may. Okay, so the, so the motion includes this language yes. changed to may? Yes. Okay. And then. Where, where it says we will, we change to may. Okay, great. And then you had mentioned it removed in Timothy, thank you so much for your memo, removed language in that, that the applicant didn't, can be denied for being incarcerated. So is the. In both sections. The yeah. So the version that we're moving now strikes incarceration here and here, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And then last question is uh, to go to the, the third page of what I provided. This is just something that Becca had raised with me this morning. Maybe you can speak to this, Becca. But um, did we mean to say a criminal activity includes arrest or just conviction? Because arrest, you can be falsely arrested all the time. And I'm assuming what we meant was just conviction, like you were found to be guilty of these things, and therefore you would be excluded, not you were arrested. And oops, we made a mistake. We're going to let you out. But now you get flagged by the housing authority. Just question for David and Tiffany if you meant to include that piece, and I don't know if Becca wants to speak through this, but. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, that, that pretty much covered what I, what I was thinking. I just, it seemed a little inconsistent both with what was uh, written earlier on in section 218, as well as um, in, the, in the statement that you sent out yesterday and that, um, and that was read earlier in the meeting. Um, just the arrest records in, in number six of the comments um, that were uh, dated on the 25th that arrest records um, alone will not be grounds for denial. So I just wanted to, to clarify kind of what it is exactly that we were voting on if that was changed from um, from the copy of the plan that we got earlier or on Friday. So, so, so um, j just so that everybody understands exactly where we're at, we're at the part where it talks about evidence of criminal activity and clues, but it's not limited to. And so that's a, so it's three categories under there which is describing what we may consider as criminal activity um, for, for that purpose. And I'll let our attorney um, speak further to that point. I think you want to, the, the section that has any arrest and or, or conviction in terms of evidence of criminal activity, you want to keep arrest in there. It isn't, it isn't a situation where it differs when you look back at um, the bottom of page 25, is that what you were talking about? Um, well, the, 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 the three pieces of evidence for criminal activity is on 27. Correct. And then, yes, on so page when, 25. When you look at page 25, the, what it talks about there is that the Housing Authority will not deny assistance solely based on arrest. But I think it's something where you, you do, I think the Housing Authority would be well served to at least look at a situation if there's an arrest in terms of what's what's the overall picture and and I think it's one of those situations where um, Ms. Pat addressed it um, when she was speaking was and I, I wrote it down because it made a lot of sense you look at the past behavior not necessarily the criminal record but I think arrest may fall into that too in past behavior and, and there's no question somebody can be falsely arrested but I think it's something to say we're not even going to consider that I think is a bad choice because you you may have situations where somebody is arrested and for whatever reason maybe it's domestic battery maybe it's something else mm -hmm. and a witness doesn't want to come forward or there's something going on where um, they th 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 there's all kinds of possibilities out there but the bottom line is I don't I don't think the housing authority should just eliminate that from the consideration but I think you are also saved from the perspective of that you're not going to deny solely on arrest I think that's pretty clear on the page 25. I, I agree on that, what you're saying, because uh, we do, to keep in our residents safe, we do have to look at different stuff because we just cannot let people in the housing and not know what they're doing. That's my perception because I'm the resident for housing. And there's been some situations that have occurred here lately that we won't talk about now, but we have to keep these residents safe. Okay, so um, I, I think we was able to cover um, the concerns, and um, I don't know 
far as with the motion, where do we go from here? <coughs> So the resolution, um, okay. Uh, she's passing out to change pages, but the resolution will, will read the changes, and that's what we read out and gave to you guys. Uh, it may not be in a, a policy that we put out for public comment, but it's in the resolution that we gave you guys. This is the resolution of the changes. Uh, I mean, sorry, I have so many pieces of paper in front of me. This is the resolution of the um, changes. Hey, Becca, this is the resolution of the changes related to all aspects of our admin plan and not just the criminal background. Now, what Lily just passed out was the criminal background changes, right? Yes. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Commissioner Henry? Yes. Commissioner Adair? Yes. Commissioner Turnbull? Yes. Commissioner Chandler? Yes. Well, thank you, sir. We'll start with the employee of the month. Um, Tiffany will be handling the um, duties of doing the employee of the month, but I do want to just mention that uh, in terms of our added level of um, transparency, we started live streaming our board meeting. So um, today is the first meeting that we're live streaming. So along with uh, the city, I mean, well, with Urbana Television recording it for us, we're live streaming it to show individuals that may not watch TV at 12 o'clock, uh, 12 a.m. Or, or different times that our board members may show. Also, our board meetings are put on our website for individuals to uh, view, and we have a YouTube account that all our board meetings are on. So individuals have the right and the opportunity to look at uh, our board meetings at any time. Tiffany. So I want to present the uh, employee of the month. He's not with us today, <laughs> um, but we'll go ahead and, and speak of him. Um, his name is David Graham. He works in our maintenance department. Um, Graham is a great, great at multitasking. He is able to complete assignments in a timely manner, even while getting interrupted by other requests from his supervisor and residents. He hardly ever walks around without a smile on his face. You can tell he really enjoys his job. The residents can trust him uh, to do what, they, what he needs to do. Uh, David, Hack, uh, thanks you for all that you do to make a, a great workplace. Um, we have this nice trophy for him when I run into him, <laughs> as well as a Hack t-shirt, <laughs> Walmart, Walmart gift card, and a wonderful certificate. <laughs> um, in addition, we wanted to, who's not, this person isn't here as well, um, but we wanted to give um, a, uh, a congratulations to our LSS intern. Um, for the past few months, we've had Kai Oliver um, from, the, from U of I at Champaign Urbana. Uh, he's worked with our LSS department. He's very, worked very tirelessly, and he will be completing his assignment with us uh, here soon. So thank you, Kai. Thank you, Tiffany. So, uh, Ty was great, but David is great also, our employee of the month. Uh, he's fairly new. He's probably one of our newest maintenance uh, personnel, uh, but he works extremely hard. He just left HQS training, which I'll go right into in terms of my report. As you know, we are really working hard to uh, build capacity with our organization, but also share the wealth and do it more cost efficiently. So we invited, our, so we're having trainings. The trainers are coming to our um, facility here and training our staff and cross-training our staff. But when we have a number of seats open, we're allowing other organizations to benefit in terms of paying their portion of the trainer, which help discount our organization. At our HQS training, we had a number of our staff members along with RPC 
and at least two or three other housing authorities from either even Wisconsin, as far as west well Wisconsin, came down uh, to be trained. And so I'm excited about that, and I'm more excited about us having that ability to cost uh, to make training more cost efficient and across train our staff to build capacity. But a part of that was where well, we were working with uh, at least five clients. Uh, to build opportunities of um, um, small businesses. As you know, being a housing authority with RAD and Affordable Housing Developments Project-Based Vouchers, we have to have a third party individual or company do our inspections. And so when we decided to bring an HQS inspector in, we came up with the notion of why not create uh, small businesses here uh, with inspection duties that we can hire. Right now we hire a contractor uh, who's based in um, San Diego with an office in Chicago, and they send somebody down from Chicago. Once we finish this training and help equip those uh, clients uh, with the equipment and um, work toward um, them having their stall small business started, they'll have contracts with the housing authority to do our inspections. We even accompany them and set up meetings for them to go over to the Small Business Association to start that paperwork and build a uh, business plan. So. I know a number of staff in here that attended that training, but it was just something I really wanted to mention how we're trying to help move forward and benefit our uh, clients along with providing the services that we have to provide as a housing authority. One of the new activities that we have, we uh, created the position as a uh, um, resident empowerment coordinator. One of the things we saw that we kind of left out the young people in terms of our MTW activities. Uh, we just focused on the 18 to 54 year olds and so our resident um, enrichment uh, coordinator, empowerment coordinator, not, not only works with all levels of um, age groups, but they also work with our young people. We have a tennis camp going on right now where we built a, a relationship with the University of Illinois um, uh, tennis, tennis coaches. And so a number of our uh, young people have been going over to the university week after week to participate in a tennis um, camp. And so we're working with golf and other uh, programs also. We just want to show and again, give access to our young people of different types of sports and also um, give them top quality training by the Division I coaches over at the University of Illinois. Um, we have an event coming up that's part of our fundraiser for our Richmond uh, Foundation, which the Housing Authority of Champaign County, Richmond Foundation is a, a certified 501c3, and that foundation um, is part of our efforts of raising income, well, sorry, raising money to help provide scholarships and enrichment opportunities for our young people and individuals on our program here in the county. Uh, there's flyers here, there's flyers on our website. It's called Dollars for Scholars, and it's being held August 22nd from 6 to 8 at Neal Street Blues. Again, that's August 22nd from 6 to 8 at Neal Street Blues. It'll be live music there, so um, please come out and celebrate with us and also help us uh, uh, raise some funds to help benefit our clients. Um, Staff Appreciation and Professional Development Day, we're hosting it on August 9th. Um, all the board members are, um, and their families are welcome to come. It's an opportunity to get together and, and celebrate the hard uh, year's work, but also build some professional development together. Um, the staff would be sending the commissioners if they hadn't already uh, sent them out invitations, so we have all those days locked down. Um, for the day that we plan on getting together. So uh, please allow the commission, I would like for the commissioners to come out if, if, if um, any way possible. Last year was our first time doing it and a couple of commissioners had stopped by and it was pretty uh, fun uh, for some of the staff and we learned quite a bit and built some capacity together. Pinewood is in the process of moving forward. Um, as you know, last week we approved the contract to move forward. We haven't signed the official construction contract as of yet. However, uh, we're still negotiating. Sorry, we're still negotiating some of those guidelines and those prices in order to move forward with that project. Um, I think the the grant doesn't close for the next month or so, into August. So we have some time still before we actually sign a construction contract. But we anticipate in moving forward with the contractor that we proposed last um, uh, week. Also, HUD had their proposed rule changes around um, mixed status uh, families. We did submit copies, I mean, sorry, we did submit comments um, to that for that opposed policy, and we also had had a number of opportunities to work with community leaders and community organizations to provide insight and information around that um, policy. And that policy was geared toward, the opposed policy, the proposed policy by HUD was geared toward not allowing individuals that's um, uh, undocumented to live in uh, uh, public assistance. Uh, right now, her policy is that they can live in public assistance if at least one person in their household is a, 
is a documented citizen, and um, they're responsible to pay their portion of every aspect of subsidies in the unit that they stay. Um, <clears throat> we received our MTW station, uh, station, statutory requirement provisional compliance assessment, and you know I'm just proud to say it's a copy of it in there in attachment three for our board members, but we passed every area and category under the five um, statutory requirements um, for MTW. And lastly, we have upcoming our affordable housing panel where we have a number of dignitaries and elected officials just discussing affordable housing in the county as we continually move forward to try to uh, create opportunities and programs to benefit the clients uh, and the citizens that's currently here in our county. Uh, we want to hear from individuals, so we're inviting the public along with officials and uh, elected officials out to talk about issues related to affordable housing um, based on their uh, expertise. The city of uh, Urbana along with the city of Champaign is represented. We have the state being represented, the federal government being represented, and the uh, tennis union along with a, a number of other ones. So please come out. That event will be held on Flyers mixed up. August, it'll be August 7th from 12 to 1.30 here at the House Authority's office. Thank you. Unless the commissioners had any other. No. Okay. Uh, last month we mentioned that the House Authority received uh, four national awards of merit and we were enrolled in uh, the opportunity to receive two additional national awards of excellence for programs and projects that we worked on here locally that benefit the clients that we serve and the community that we so love to represent. Um, those four awards are in, on our back wall there. Uh, you can see them for the opportunity. Um, we have still opportunity in October to get two national awards of excellence. And one of those awards of excellence is for our project that we did in Muhammad is under redevelopment. And the other one was for, you remember? The emergency family shelter. Oh, the emergency family shelter. So again, um, it's, it's just great to be able to be recognized for uh, the great work you do. And being recognized, I know some people don't um, take that as a, a great honor, but being recognized by your peers, it brings more credibility to you, what you do as an organization and the clients and your staff members and the community leaders around showing that um, you're really moving forward in the right direction. And having our name in lights and having awards is a great thing, and I'm proud to be a part of this organization. Even at the most recent um, NARO conference where we received those awards that I presented along with the University of Illinois um, to the conference about our MTW study and the progress that we've made. Um, Commissioner uh, Dr. Henry and myself presented on a panel related to commissioners and executive directors and CEOs relationships and how we move things forward. And I presented alongside the Oakland House Authority and the Cambridge House Authority about the benefits of having a, um, MTW activities having an MTW status and RAD and how it's benefiting organizations. HUD is in the process of adding another 100 MTW agencies and they're using, Champaign County is one of the models that they use. Um, they have different cohorts and we have activities uh, <clears throat> around three of the major cohorts that they have. The only one we don't have is landlord initiatives, but we're working internally to work on a program around landlord initiatives. Thank you. Now we'll move to our reports. And so the first report Northern. coming up. Mr. Northern. Okay. Um, we have a, a closed session. We have a closed session today. And um, in that closed session, we'll be talking about real estate, uh, personnel issues, reorganization around the personnel, and uh, one litigation. We have a call coming in. Well, two of the uh, individuals that we need to discuss uh, issues with, we, instead of flying them in and um, call, charging uh, more expenses to the house on we asked for them to call in. So we set that time at four. So what I would ask if we could move the closed session up since the uh, main action of the board had already been approved. And then we start our closed session and then come back to finish up our board meeting so we can make those two calls. The only, it, it'll be no action on the items that we discuss in closed section. The only action would be uh, approval of the financial reports. Uh, once well, we're not, after we come back. You, don't, you don't have to worry because we're coming back anyway. Okay. All right. okay. You second? Second. 
Hold on, just to make sure this is for uh, personnel, mitigation, and uh, real estate, correct? Yes. Okay. Chairman Lewis? Yes. Vice Chair Rose? Yes. Commissioner Wachowski? Yes. Commissioner Henry? Yes. Commissioner Adair? Yes. Commissioner Turnbull? Yes. Commissioner Chinaway? Yes. 